Thank you. Okay, so unfortunately we missed Angela's incredible advice uh, <laughs> about using graded surveys to capture and check in with students each week. Um, so now John is sharing the screen so you can see what's happening on that activity sheet. Um, and those guiding questions that I just had on that slide are at the top. John, if you wouldn't mind showing that, highlighting that real quick. Um, so those are the same questions that we saw on the slides, so they're repeated here since we're not sharing the slides anymore. So uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll notice that big open space to be able to post your questions uh, if you want something specific answered. Um, but I'd also like to keep, our, keep with the sharing and questions that we have here uh, orally whether or not you want to use your videos up to you. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone from the group that I was in, group two, want to bring up some of the things you all were talking about. I'd be happy to call a name. <laughs> Call the name. Call the name. Call the name. Uh, be, be okay with be okay with silence. <laughs> this is Karen. Ahead, Karen. Um, I was in a breakout room with Regina and with um, Hazel, and um, we talked a little bit about how important it is to just build connection, um, and also um, how do we do how do we um, help students connect in a creative way so that it's so that it's authentic. So that was kind of the direction that we were heading. Um, we also talked about um, that deep engagement and how, um, you know, I guess having it be learner centered um, and not as much instructor centered. Um, I think it's a, a very high level summary. Please jump in Hazel and Regina um, if you have other comments to add. It was a good conversation and then um, Karen brought us back into the main room and, and we got started a little bit late, so I, um, it was really a nice, um, quick conversation. So, go ahead, Kari, you were just about to turn your mic back on. I know I um, nope, I'm, I'm okay. good. So I was just gonna ask, um, Kari brought up this idea of how do we kind of foster this connection and make it meaningful, create authentic kinds of experiences for our students um, in the way that they collaborate or about what they or what they collaborate about. Are there what strategies are y'all using? Let's not even focus just on remote here, but what things are you doing to create these authentic experiences for you and, and those opportunities to engage socially with each other, to share those and learn from each other? Tom, go ahead. Thanks, Karen. Um, I've been teaching online fully for a long, long time, and one of the guiding principles for me has always been butts out of seats. And it's amazing that uh, you know when we first approach remote teaching or online teaching, we can feel like we have to have this self-contained classroom that's sort of you know spaceship classroom, and we can't really get outside the walls of it, but the most social interactions that I've had with my online learners have been the ones where I've asked them to go outside of the boundaries of our classroom. So if I know I have colleagues who are working in the field that I'm teaching them about, uh, I'll ask them to get in contact with those folks, or I'll bring in a guest lecturer or expert to record a quick thing for my students and get them thinking. Uh, or I'll ask my students to uh, start interviewing one another about their own study habits, their own practices, and treat each other as a repository of expertise, as well as starting to get them to look outside of or beyond their mobile device or their laptop or their desktop computer. Uh, 
anytime I can get my students to uh, to connect with one another after they have taken some action that isn't based in the online environment, they tend to talk more, they tend to speak up more, they tend to interact more, they tend to have more questions. So even in a webinar like this, having those breakout rooms, you notice that everybody felt a little more comfortable talking to one another. And so, you know, having those interactions go beyond just the boundaries of what we're doing immediately all together. If we can get people talking in ones and twos, if we can get them looking outside of where we are right now, those are all things that, that really increase that interaction. And I'd love to hear your stories as well, everybody who's here on the call too. I Thanks, just saw Tom. Heidi. I just saw Heidi change her feedback to the big green check mark. So thank you for the plus one on that. That's awesome. Anyone else want to share any of their um, kind of opportunities for authentic experiences in your classroom? Yeah, so Kari posted in the chat how um, spending more time in synchronous channels working in the human connection is so important right now. Uh, so providing a space for conversation around anything, whether pets, recipes, daily routines, are helping keep authentic human-centric connections. I think that's a really great point. Um, and, you know, and I think one thing to remember is that all of our content, I think that's a safe thing to say, is around us in some way. And so finding ways to have students connect what they're learning about in our courses to what's in their worlds um, is, a, is a really great way just to do that. And it can be really flexible by doing that. Um, and different students will have different experiences. And like Tom said, I'm really curious about what you all do in your classrooms to promote these kinds of experiences. Angela says she created a couple of padlets for sharing images. The popular one was for students to share pics of their pets. Uh, that's really cool, Angela. Yeah, great. So Angela is also linked to Padlet in the chat, and um, Padlet might be a good one to put a link into the activity sheet as well. Um, I know that there is some limits how many free Padlets you can get. Um, I have not looked to see if it's been expanded during this time. Um, Karen says three. Karen, do you know if they have expanded that during the pandemic or not? I haven't checked when I checked just a week ago. They haven't, okay. but it is free and you can just keep wiping them out and using them over sure. and over again. Uh, so I've, I only use the same three constantly and it, it's, it seems to work, but I, I wish they would extend it, but I don't think they have. Sure. Um, and so Padlet is a great, uh, it's a great tool for sharing. Um, and the only thing I would say about it is, you know, keeping in mind that it's it's not a university supported tool, it's an outside tool. So um, just being mindful of what you're having students share there. Um, but it is a good opportunity to kind of, yeah, it's really easy to use. I've seen, uh, so Angela gave the example of students are sharing pics of their pets and uh, things, images like in general, but I've also seen an instructor use a Padlet and students recorded video introductions and posted their video introductions on the Padlet. Um, so that's one way to, again, how to foster that human connection remotely. Um, keep, I think the more senses we're able to and to to what's the word I'm looking for, trigger, uh, the more human it seems. Um, although I would also argue that we can have human connections just via text as well. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's impossible. Um, other tools or strategies or approaches. Karen, do you want to speak to how you easily save results before you wipe it out? Yes, I like to keep everything because that's just me. I like to, because I do a lot of these for self-reflection. So on Padlet, they have a lot of great ways. You can either download it as an Excel, you can download it as a JPEG. And one other way, they have three different formats, PDF. Uh, you can download it in three different ways. So you can keep 
that information, you know, in case you want to use it for the future. So I do that each time so I can have a record of what people reflected on for that, for that uh, Padlet. Great. So yeah, as long as it's a static uh, thing, right? You Obviously, if that wouldn't work for the videos, but that's okay. Um, also, Kari says she also appreciates silly gifts, means, etc. that some platforms allow and offer. I, I can't disagree with you on that. It's one of the things I really like about Microsoft Teams is that you can, you can share gifts with people. Uh, <laughs> and you can make your own memes on Microsoft Teams. Did you guys know that? <laughs> um, yes, Kari says Padlet downloaded conversations could be turned into a word cloud. That's a cool strategy. <laughs> Plus one for Teams, says John. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. If you haven't had an opportunity to be part of the conversation yet, consider also answering the opposite question to the one that's on offer. The, the question now is, how do you? But where do you see that there are still gaps? Uh, where are you having trouble reaching out to your learners? Where don't you feel like there's that human connection? And, and we'll all come, come chiming in and help out. I was curious for the people that are on this group right now, if they're seeing students do less communications as they're going on or more communications as they get more familiar with this, because I am I hear a lot of concerns of students not communicating as much. So I was wondering of the people who are teaching here today, if you're seeing what kind of communications you're seeing from your students, increase, decrease, same. So one of the things that I think is kind of interesting about the um, synchronous connections, at least, is that running chat on the side um, seems like it's a little bit more open to, um, as, as uh, Karen Sp uh, Spader said, the, the funny gifts and the plus ones and the smiley faces and such um, that people can add to that. And all of that is documented in some ways, right? We see it happening on the side of, the, of our screen. In our face-to-face -face classrooms, we can kind of see them talking with each other, but we don't know what they're saying. Um, and here we often see what they're saying, at least in the public forum or, or in the classroom forum. What we can't see is um, what they're saying to each other on GroupMe or what they're saying to each other on their social media or private chats back and forth to each other. Those things are happening all the time, just as they used to happen with uh, past notes and such. And, and to your point right there, Heidi is posting in the chat. She says, meeting with students one-on-one -on -one requires a lot of energy, but the payoff is worth it for the students. For the instructor, though, I need time to recover. And that's absolutely emotional labor uh, and work that we do as instructors. And when I teach my online courses, what I'll do is I'll set up, if I've got a 15-week semester, right around week two, I'll just say, if anybody wants to have a one-on-one 10-minute -on -one, conversation with me, here's how to set it up and, and let's talk. And for whatever reason, you wanna just chat, you wanna to get to know your instructor, you have a question, a concern, and people tend to take me up on that. And it, it is a lot of, of time and setup for me, but it really means that I'm making those connections with my students. And then I don't have to do that every single week. I'll usually say, you know, a week before uh, there's a large assignment due or a week before a test or an exam, hey, the one-on-ones are open again, come on by and, you know, my students know that they can reach out to me anytime, but formally saying this is now a time when not only it's okay, but I'm expecting to have those quieter, smaller conversations with you is really important. So Heidi, thank you very much for, for sparking that part of the conversation. And uh, Angela's also got some uh, conversation here in the chat as well. Time and space for group work. We would all have lots of class time for this before, Angela has created Blackboard Ultra Rooms for each group where they all have presenter status and it's just a place for them to meet. It's also useful for Angela's weekly check-ins with each group and she's not sure whether they're using it much. She'll be working it into the activities in the next couple of weeks. Excellent, thank you for sharing that, that practice. 
That's really cool. Anybody else want to, to share either out loud or in the activity document or in the chat? This is a conversation for everybody. And Karen, you wanted to, to come in here too. Yeah, Angela, I wanted to ask, um, you say I, uh, I'll be working it into the activities in the next couple of weeks. Can you elaborate on that, how you're going to do that? Still, it's still a work in progress, but um, the project that they've been working on is going to need to kind of be synthesized over the next couple of weeks into a final um, kind of poster is the idea. Uh, so I'm probably going to try to get groups to, within the group, set up a time, hopefully like an hour at some point during the week where they can all meet together in the room to work on an activity. Um, that part you know, it's a challenge, right? They all have different schedules at this point, and I can't really rely on my course time being available to everyone, um, especially since a couple of students are in California, so it's a different time zone. Um, so yeah, I'm still kind of thinking about that. I will say they have a final um, video presentation to make, where t in pairs, they're going to be presenting a paper. And so I'm going to be using, I set up like six recording session rooms that will be open um, during a sort of a week window so that pairs can meet in the space. They'll sign up for a block of time, get together and practice, and then they can like record their session. Um, so that'll be a way that I'm actually working it into the activity is they need to produce a video. They're in two different places. How do you do that? Um, so I'm going to have them use the screen sharing function as well as the recording function in um, BBC Ultra to to kind of create a video. Mm -hmm. And are you planning on meeting with those groups there to like help them navigate that tech use or um, have you done that already? Do you have resources? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> they keep asking. <laughs> but for next week, I'm gonna have essentially a guide. I'll create a guide in Canvas. I've been sort of each week creating guides for them where I do some screen capture videos and things to sort of walk them through um, how to set up a video. But then if needed, I'm happy to like hop in and, and kind of walk it through with each group. Cool. Very cool. Karen Skibba, did you have something that you wanted to say? I noticed your mic is on. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, that's no. all right. I forgot yeah. to turn it off. Yeah, great. That uh, those are, sounds like some really great plans, uh, Angela. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's see, where are we on this tip sheet? Um, I wonder if anyone has thoughts on the question two following guiding question number three. What strategies do people have to counter clicks that already exist? So these kind of informal groups, peer groups that are in your class together um, and they already are using some sort of collaborative tool to study. Um, so how are you countering that? How might you take what is there and bring that back to advantage or benefit other students who aren't invited to those groups. This is a interesting. Uh, so this is this was my question actually, and it's a it's a struggle that I continue to have. Um, sort of a, in the vein of equity, um, we know for example a lot of student groups, the fraternities and sororities and such, will have um, people taking the courses together, people connected with past people who have taken the courses, um, and they offer support to each other. And that's sort of built into that membership of that uh, fraternal organization. But there are some people that are not in that, right? And the same things are happening now in these online uh, versions, the remote instruction courses. So are there ways that you can build into your course um, ways to pull other people into some of these existing groups, maybe not the same existing groups, but can you create um, other opportunities for people who aren't already part of that to have that same sort of support that they get from each other? JT, go ahead. John, just to, to understand your question, is it more how do you encourage students to befriend one another in the online environment? I mean, it, so, yeah, so 
Karen Spader and I were having this discussion yesterday and putting together the activity sheet. I was like, well, is it peer-to-peer -peer learning or is it social learning? And there's that sort of sense of like, well, maybe social learning is more like, oh, we're friends, so we're going to support each other. Whereas peer-to-peer -peer is, well, we're not necessarily friends, but we're in the class together, so let's support each other. That question of befriending is, 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 is a good one. Um, is befriending necessary in order to support your colleagues and peers and your classmates? Um, or are there other ways that you can do that without saying, hey, student A, you must be friends with student B. Now go work together. Go ahead, Tom. And uh, Heidi's raising a good question in the chat. She says, here's a logistical question. How do you ensure that students have each other's emails so that they can contact one another to set up group me or arrange to meet in a Blackboard Collaborate room? I know Canvas has made some changes in people regarding which personal information is available. So I, part of the reason that Canvas has done that is to protect the students' privacy, who, those who don't want to share out their emails and such, right? Um, so one way, I think this is true for students, I know it's true for instructors, use the Canvas inbox. You should be able to connect with other students in your course via the Canvas inbox. And if they want to, and again, this is if they're friends already or if they want to be friends, they can give those email addresses back to and forth with each other um, on their own. But I don't know what the policies are as far as uh, the FERPA federal protection um, things, as far as students sharing emails with each other. A lot of this is already in uh, the student directory, so they can access that if they know their names. Some students have FERPA flags on it, so they say, I don't want to be part of that group. So these are all sort of issues that uh, the answers are not clear cut. There are no. Um, there are nuances, we'll say. Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure um, where the connection lies. So like if you in your student account, you set up the FERPA flag for sharing your email. Um, I know that in Outlook, your email will not show up in the global address list. Now, I don't know if that's connected to Canvas. I'm not actually sure. I'm not I'm not clear on what people can and can't see on that people tab either in the whole class setup or in canvas groups which is what Angela is following up with um, I'm not sure but as John pointed out and as Karen put in the chat if you use the canvas inbox that's your workaround so um, because in canvas uses that inbox and it'll push to your email unless they have that turned off which I don't know, you can't control that, I suppose, but um, the default is that any inbox message will push to your email. So students would get it that way, and students can use the inbox and go to their course and email individual students or all students or the whole class. Um, if you're in our remote readiness course, which you probably all are, you've gotten my messages from the using the Canvas inbox and just sending those messages to all in the course. Um, so yeah, it's called Canvas Conversations. Uh, it's the little, what is that on the side? Is it a, a mail? Oh, it just says inbox on your red navigation pane in Canvas. It looks like a fax machine, <laughs> doesn't it? It's Isn't an that envelope. It? It's an envelope with oh. it's a letter in an envelope. Mm -hmm. There you go. That, that old fashioned technology. Hey, John, can you scroll down a little bit on what you're sharing on your screen so we can see the yes. notes? Cool. Sorry. Um, Angela, to your question about what students see, um, I'm in the remote readiness course as a student, and students cannot see um, in the people tab email addresses. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, clarity. where was I? Here I was. Sorry, Tom. Cool, thanks. Um, so, John, we never really finished talking about countering or rather maybe instead of putting the negative connotation of countering on how about encouraging the circulation of what's happening in these informal groups back to the whole course um, I find that the circulation of knowledge is a really important component for learning um, if when we think about a one-way approach to learning where a teacher 
lectures and student receives and that's the end of it. Um, we, we see very clearly why that's a low quality learning experience, whereas a teacher gives information, a student receives it, and then the student returns their perspective, their interpretation. Um, and then, right, so now we get this dialogue back and forth, so we're circulating knowledge. Obviously, that's going to increase that quality of learning experience, um, and that is increased kind of exponentially the more connections we're able to allow. And so from a learning theory perspective, the more connections we're able to make in this network of our um, of the learning sphere, if we are to call it that, which is a weird way to think of it, uh, the deeper the, the learning experience is going to be, the higher quality it's going to be. So I think that any ways that we can find, create avenues to circulate that knowledge is important. How do we do that? How do we, not just how do we do it, right? Creating the avenues is one thing and it's arguably pretty easy, but how do we encourage people to participate in that? culture, right? That culture of sharing. That's the big question. Tom? Go ahead, Tom. And, and I, I have a sneaky sidebar to that whole question. And I'll say we're doing it right now. Notice that in this lab session, you can come on synchronously and talk verbally with everybody. You can put something into the chat you can go over to the activity document and we'll put that link back into the chat here in a couple of seconds as well. Uh, and you can edit that in real time with us. But you've got some options for how you respond and none of them is privileged. No, it's not like, oh, all you people who aren't using the verbal, you must be doing something wrong or better or worse than. It's any which way that you go. And that's the way that participation happens. So having those multiple avenues, giving students a choice and participants a choice in how they interact is really powerful because you're going to select the method that is right for you in the moment. We have a participant here uh, from halfway across the world and Dustin is probably just listening uh, because of lag time or, or those kinds of things and that's okay too. So having multiple ways for people to respond means that more people will respond. JT. I mean, just to, to play devil's advocate, I mean, we're talking a lot about these social connections and I think a lot of people, I think a portion of the conversation should also address the fact that, you know, outside of the classroom, people have 10,000 other things that they're worried about. They're trying to spend time um, with their friends who may or may not be taking the same class with their family. Um, with other friends who are across the nation or, you know, whatever the case may be. And so I just wonder if um, sort of really emphasizing and sort of trying to drill students into, um, you know, groups may not be, in fact, detrimental in the short term because, you know, they, they already have, they may not have the time necessary um, to build these social connections. And I I'm not saying that, you know, uh, collaboration is a bad idea. I'm just sort of in the short term, you know, I, I really appreciate Tom's um, perspective of allowing all types of participation, be it, you know, in a chat or, you know, orally in a conversation, but that doesn't necessarily seem as collaborative as the ideal form of collaboration that we're talking about here. In, in some ways, we're talking about multiple means of a, per, a representation of expression, um, and this goes back to the universal design for learning framework, right? Um, where we let people sort of step back if they need to step back, but we also have to give them multiple opportunities. So online, as Tom says, or listening and just chatting, or stepping in, unmuting your microphone and jumping into the conversation. Um, and I think that that's great. One of the other ways that we address this is formally in our education by setting up things like the, um, what I'm sharing on the screen right now, we set up interactive, con interactive learning where students have to sort of challenge each other. We do that in groups. We give each other, uh, we give students roles to play, right? So you take role A, you take role B, you take role C. It's sort of a jig sign um, where you, push your perspective. Um, and so we, we assign that, we sort of force that already formally 
do we need to go further and say, okay, now in your study groups, um, can you um, bring in so-and-so on the side here as well? Or if they need those study groups, I mean, can we structure our class so that those study groups don't offer advantages um, because we have enough of the activities that we see here, uh, the interactive activities where they're already challenging each other um, and there, it's not about memorizing um, specific things. I don't know the answer to this. Yeah, and I think also to your point, JT, that there's a spectrum of social learning experiences that both achieve more or less, but also have different goals or maybe are more appropriate for different goals. And so I think that it's fair to say in our current situation with the rest of this semester, providing opportunities simply to share insights, questions, confusions, understandings is valuable in and of itself. Whether we're able to promote deeper, lasting, more complex interactions is a different question entirely. Um, not one that isn't appropriate for now, but it is a different question, right? Um, so I guess my point is merely there's value in even what we'll call even the weakest, most superficial forms of social learning experiences. There's value in those, um, even if it's just voluntary sharing of questions. That's beneficial for students learning because they start to see, well, one, if people share their questions, which actually can make students more confident in their learning because they don't feel alone in having questions. And so when they're, they feel more confident in their own weaknesses, they're more willing, um, maybe willing is a bad choice of words, but to uh, persevere. <laughs> um, so creating that shared space for that. Um, and we all know there's value in peer-to-peer -to -peer teaching too, right? We all have different takes on things, and so the more opportunities we can allow for students to share their understandings, um, even if it isn't the intent of having dialogue, just sharing those understandings can be really valuable as well. Yeah, I agree entirely, and one thing I, I really, I think we should um, emphasize, and I think has been emphasized um, to a large extent, is the possibility of, A, options and their multiplicity, but also that participation is optional. I think this is um, goes back to Tom's comment um, a few minutes ago that you know not every single week um, people are logging into um, the video chat, but sort of um, they can when they will, or they will when they can. Um, and I think that's um, I guess something that I'm trying to to grapple with um, with the. If everything is voluntary and optional, you know, are we really, I don't know, I'm just grappling with that. Um, I'm more concerned with trying to pigeonhole people into a group for the sake of the group uh, yeah. and just trying to, I'm fighting through that idea currently. Sure. Especially from like a, um, from my background perspective, I'm not currently teaching, but you know, there's you know, 10,000 different meetings per day and just sort of the obligation of participation is something that's a little, it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Angela posted in the chat, um, she's using collaborations, shared space. So each group has a Google Drive folder that is shared with her and weekly activities are being added to subfolders. One collaborative activity has been building a collection of references on the enzyme that they're researching for all group members to add to and or draw from. Um, and John asked, do students collect these references? And she says, yes, one reference per student per week. Wait, one ref per student week one that they will that they summarized in the doc, and then another student this week. Oh, okay, so each week is a different student I'm following, right. Um, yeah, so this kind of collaborative curation of resources, um, I really love that. I, I, I had a similar uh, project in a course that I taught. It was teaching with tech, no, that's John's course. What was the, 
anyway, it was a, a class for masters of secondary ed students, and um, it was about teaching with technology and somehow. Um, anyway, that's what I had students do as well. It was the full project, so it was probably um, maybe a little more robust than than what she's got here, um, but nonetheless, it was small student groups, and throughout the term, they curated a resource page digitally uh, because it was a blended course, and so um, same kind of proj project. Uh, it was not divided like Angela's was, where one student per week, but it was across the semester, and all students were working together, um, but that student curation idea. So it is 11.05 and uh, we've been keeping with tradition of ending the recording after an hour and then sticking around to offer uh, other thoughts, questions, conversations if you want to stay, um, but also welcoming people if they have other tasks they need to take care of today, other meetings they need to attend, um, that you are welcome to leave.